a great landscape changing move of God is available now. It's not coming one day, someday, it's now. However, there are things in the spirit that I believe we need to take to the courts of heaven to see things removed and unlocked so we'd experience the fullness of what the Holy Spirit wants to pour into the earth. Get ready for a revelation that will change your life. Welcome to The Resting Place, a place where you will experience the supernatural presence and power of God both in and upon you where you will meet face to face with the Holy Spirit in a tangible way, and where you will encounter signs, wonders, and miracles. Join Larry Sparks, prophetic teacher, lecturer on revival, and publisher for Destiny Image today, as together we enter into The Resting Place. Welcome to The Resting Place. I'm your host, Larry Sparks, and on this program, we teach you how to create a resting place for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I am so grateful to have author, apostolic leader, and somebody I consider to be a dear friend, Robert Henderson, with me today. Now, for those of you who may not know, Robert Henderson is the best-selling author of the Courts of Heaven series. You have taken that message all over the world, but I love it because it's more than a message, it's more than a book. It's something you've seen so many measurable results from. And somebody that you and I both honored, the late C. Peter Wagner, talked about there's a lot of people who come together and they pray, and then the result is they felt better. We're not praying to feel better, we're actually praying to see measurable results happen. Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was Peter's, uh, as a mentor into my life, a father in my life, that was one of Peter's biggest and, and most um, significant standards yeah. was that there would be measurable results. And so, you know, when I introduced the court of heaven to him, uh, we were sitting in his living room. He actually said, Robert, he said, this is a game changer. Mm. That, I mean, and then he wrote that. Uh, in the first book as a, as a an endorsement, an endorsement of yes. the first book that he said, hey, this is a game changer because he looked at me and he said, you know, I've always taught people we were on a battlefield. Mm. And he said, but you're telling me we're in the courtroom. And he said, that does actually make a huge, massive change and difference in the way we approach things in the spirit world. Yeah, and, and Peter obviously was known for spiritual warfare, pioneering the prayer movement. And the thing is, you don't necessarily teach against the battlefield, but once we have the victory and the verdict in the courtroom, we can be successful that's, on the battlefield. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, Revelation 19, 11, mm. when Jesus comes back on the white horse, the scripture says his method, his mode of operation is he judges and makes war. Judging is judicial activity. It's getting things legally in place. And then from that, you make war. One of our problems is so often we're attacking principalities and powers yep. while they still claim a legal right. Mm. And if you don't go into the courts and actually through repentance and some other things, get the legal claims of the enemy neutralized because of the blood of Jesus. If you don't do that, then what happens is if you go after him, you'll be unsuccessful, but you'll also experience backlash. Yeah, yeah. And that's what so many people have. And, and what I try to teach them is how to be victorious without, you know, without coming under massive attack. Well, yeah, it's interesting because the topic we're talking about today, you have a new book, Releasing Revival and Resurrection yeah. from the Courts of Heaven. This whole show, The Resting Place, is about revival, focusing on the move of God. I love this because I think there is a sense right now. There's a national sense, particularly in America. I think there's a global sense. God is on the move, that there is a great outpouring of the Spirit that's not coming one day, someday. It's available now. But I really believe the courts of heaven teaching is an, it's an essential ingredient for us to step in to what God has already made available. Because I find, and you tell me if I'm wrong, a lot of when, when people apply the courts of heaven, when they go into the courts of heaven, mm -hmm. I had to correct myself because it's not a formula. Right. It, it, it's, it's actually a realm in the spirit. But I find it's not a matter of God's unwillingness. God's willing to heal. God's willing to bring prodigal children home. God's willing to give us breakthrough. God's more than willing to send revival. It's not a matter of the willingness of God. I think it's a matter of dealing with things, legal claims in the spirit realm, whether it's for somebody's healing or breakthrough or even something corporate and national like revival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we make a really big mistake when we, when we paint a picture that says that we have to convince God to do what he's already said he wants to do. 
For instance, in Romans 8, the scripture says, will he not with him, Jesus, freely give us all things? Mm -hmm. In other words, the whole idea is that when Jesus died on the cross, that, that all that we need, everything that pertains to life and godliness has already been given to us. Yes. Well, why are we experiencing it? It's because of legal claims. So we're not trying to convince God in prayer to do something for us. I think that is an old mentality that we need to maybe retire. Yes. What we're trying to do or what, we're, what we need to do is, is cooperate with God in the spirit world through prayer to get legal things in place because it is the powers of darkness, yes. the principalities and powers that are actually holding up what God wants to, wants to see happen. And it's our job to get that in place. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And it's interesting because sometimes people struggle in the New Testament or the New Covenant with some of these realities being in place. That's something like a generational curse or iniquity or things like that, or even sin, bloodline stuff, mm -hmm. could be actually holding something back. Well, didn't God take care of all that? Well, the re I mean, you, you could probably condense that very easily. He did. I mean, we were talking about this yep. at dinner. God took care of all of yep. it. In the book of Galatians, we say Jesus took the curse. But give us a, just a context yep. for that, because that clearly identifies. Yeah, this. in Galatians 3.13, the Bible says that Jesus became a curse for us. Yep. Uh, and so he took the curse. Uh, and so we would say, okay, then there is no curse. But then you go to Revelation 22, verse 3, and in the millennial reign, and it says, and there shall be no more curse. So yep. I ask the question, when did the curse end? Galatians 3.13 or Revelation 22.3? Mm -hmm. And the answer is Galatians uh, 3.13 is the stated verdict of the cross. See, yeah. the, the the cross of Jesus rendered a verdict, uh, verdicts even, yes. into place in our behalf. But a verdict that's not executed into place has no power. Mm. So the, there will not be a full execution of that verdict into place until there's a new heaven and a new earth. Yes. That is the that is the full manifestation of all that Jesus did for us on the cross. Yes. Up and that's when there will be no more curse. Yep. But up until that time, we aggressively have to take what Jesus did, his blood, his body, and we have to bring that and apply that yes. in the courts of heaven so that we get the benefits of all that Jesus did for us on the cross. Yep. So what you're really doing in the courts is you're executing into place the finished works of the cross. And in a minute, I want to talk about how that pertains to national or even personal yes. revival. But it is interesting because people would hear that language, and sometimes people hear what they want to hear. Yeah. They're like, well, that sounds like a lot of works. It's works oriented. Well, it's really not. You're, you're, you're applying these things by faith. In other words, Jesus accomplished everything that needed to be done. So it's not a matter of you or I trying to do something. Jesus did the work, but by faith and simply in the place of prayer, yes. we are applying what he has done. A absolutely. It, it is one of the greatest honors mm. to take what Jesus did on the cross wow. and to be able to come and bring that into the courts so that it speaks in our behalf. Mm. And I have used that. Over, I'm, I am learning more and more. Even though I've been teaching on the course for over 11 years, I am learning more and more how to take what Jesus did and bring it as evidence into the courts of heaven and say, Lord, on the basis of this, yeah. let everything Jesus died for, let it now become a reality yes. in my life and in this nation. Yeah. But literally, let, let the move of God, let the revival of God come, let the reformation of God come, yeah. let it be known in this nation. Yeah. Well, as we get ready for the second segment where we're going to really do a deep dive into revival, awakening, and its relationship to courts of heaven, I actually sense, as Robert was talking, one of the things that Jesus made available I believe the cross declares a verdict that the Holy Spirit is available now. Jesus paid the price so that you and I could experience the fullness of the presence and the power of God. But sometimes we walk around and just think, well, it's available because of everything Jesus has, has done. That's true, but I do believe by faith we need to apply it. So get ready. We're going to teach you how to step into everything God has made available. We'll be right back. Larry Sparks is a prophetic teacher, lecturer on revival, and publisher for Destiny Image. He travels worldwide, equipping everyday believers to encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit in their everyday lives, translating God's supernatural power to the spheres of influence they have been called to. Larry is driven by a vision to see the earth filled with God's glory. 
This will happen only as every person, touched by the power of God, learns how to become a resting place for the Holy Spirit and releases His power, prophetic strategy, and presence into education, government, media, arts and entertainment, business, family, and the church. As Larry hosts meetings and seminars, the presence of God moves with great power to renew believers, revive the lost, and send forth reformers to change the world. Check out his website for more information. Well, welcome back to The Resting Place. Your host, Larry Sparks here, and I am with my guest, Robert Henderson, who is well known for his teaching on the courts of heaven. And we are talking about the relationship between the courts of heaven and revival, because again, revival, or I like to define revival as a real reviving of Pentecost, of what we see in Acts chapter two. That is the standard, I believe, of New Testament Christianity. So God has obviously made it available. Holy Spirit has been available for 2000 years. He is the spirit of revival. So I often wonder why are we not experiencing the fullness of what's already made available by the verdict of the cross. But you had mentioned to me four national sins. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe these are things that we need to deal with in the courts of heaven. Can you talk and teach about those for a moment? Yeah, you know, when, we, when we're talking about uh, releasing the move of God yeah. on any level, but especially a national level, which is what we're all contending for. And remember, we're not trying to convince God. We're trying to work together with God to remove any legal claim the enemy is using to resist that. Mm. Well, when you look at scripture, there are four basic sins that any culture is going to have to deal with. Let's start with the first one yeah, and we'll yeah. go through the list. Well, the, yeah, idolatry, yeah. the idolatry issue is, um, um, is anything that we put before God. And yeah. of course we would say, well, we're not idol worshipers. You yeah. know, we don't, we don't have idols like they had in those days, but we actually do. If, and, and this is the problem in the church, this is how the, the enemy builds a case against the church mm. and says they do not qualify for a revival. Here's why. Because they don't have God in the first place. Oh my! Remember, remember when Jesus said in the book of Revelation, He said, "Because you've left your first love." I mean, yep. think about to the to, to the church at Ephesus. He said, "If you left your first love, He said, I'm going to come and remove your candlestick." Yep. I mean, what a penalty! In other words, if the candlestick is removed, here's what would happen: you would no longer be a church. The culture would still say you were a church, but heaven wouldn't recognize you. We need to stop there on that for a moment because. And I'm going to ask a question. This might be a little controversial, but we're talking about idolatry. Could it be possible? Uh, we've got churches everywhere. I mean, there are certain, it's interesting, even in certain cities, you've got almost a church on every street corner, but the city remains untransformed. Yes. And could it be possible that an idol could be a methodology or even a way of doing church that may not accommodate God first, may actually blot out or remove the movement of the Holy Spirit. Oh, absolutely. We, we, I think we do that all the time. I think that but because we think people are uncomfortable yeah. with the Holy Spirit or they're, they're afraid that He will offend yeah. if He comes in and moves in an unorthodox way, which yeah. normally He will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, if, he, if He does that, then somehow or another people are going to, they're, they're going to, because see, here's the problem with pastors in the church today. Mm. Pastors are more concerned with losing people than they are with the absence of the Holy Spirit. Oh my. And so we, we have to, re and see that, that's a, that's a sin. The enemy takes that yeah. and he brings that as a testimony mm. against us in the courts of heaven. That's where we have to come and we have to repent and say, Lord, we repent for putting anything ahead of your will, of your desire, of the move of the Holy Spirit. We ask for you to forgive us. Yeah, yeah, wow. Now the second one was broken covenants. What does yes. that look like? Well, broken covenants can be like here in America, there's broken covenants with the Native Americans and all these things. Now, here's what I want to say about that. I believe that, that we have done the best we know how for decades now dealing with broken covenants. Mm. Here's, here's what people don't understand about the courts of heaven. We don't need to necessarily go back and rehash all of that. Yeah. We can actually go into the courts and we can say, Lord, we ask that our previous repentance mm. will be called into record. Mm. And, and all the repentance that's been done over the broken covenants with the Native American, uh, any, any other people group that we've abused or, or misused or whatever, we're yes. asking uh, slavery 
slavery, all these kinds of things. We're asking for, uh, for that to be, for our previous repentance to be called into record because heaven records everything. Wow. And so we can let, we can say, let that speak. I've done this in the courts and have seen that be very, very effective by calling into record the previous repentance that we've already walked in. Yep. Now the third thing is interesting because I know many when it comes to the subject of innocent blood. Mm -hmm. I know people like Lou Engel or Dutch Sheets who have been really going after this. I really do believe that there is a connection. I'm not quite sure, and this is just me hypothesizing, a connection between what could happen with the overturn of Roe v. Wade and really even the ending of abortion on a national level, and perhaps a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But well, let's just talk about that. Yeah, what because you... the shedding of innocent blood, what, the, what what innocent blood does is it creates altars in the spirit world yeah. that cry out for blood. So so people don't realize as horrendous as the killing of a baby is, yeah. there's ad, actually an additional issue, and that is that there are blood altars, and these blood the, these altars are empowered by this blood. Yeah. And it cries out and literally opens the portals of the demonic over our nation. Yeah, yeah. That's why so many things have happened in our nation since the legalization of abortion through yeah. Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And so whenever we get that shut down, the Bible says if they found a dead man uh, in the field, oh, yeah. they had to measure to the closest city. Because wh whoever he was closest to, they had they didn't you, they didn't have to know why he was killed. They had to make atonement for that blood mm. because if atonement wasn't made for that blood, that blood would cry out and empower demonic activity against that city. Wow. Somebody had to take ownership of that blood. Yeah, yeah. And see, that's what we as the church we have to take ownership of the blood. Mm. But but if we can get that altar, if we can get that altar shut down. If we can get that blood uh, stopped from speaking, then we can shut the portal that it's opening yeah. that's allowing all the demonic activity. And I believe is even actually very strongly resisting the move of the Spirit coming in, into, the, into the, the, the nation the way we desire. Because sometimes people will say, well, if abortion laws nationally are overturned, I've even heard believers say this, well, it's not really a big deal because then it goes obviously to a state by state level. But I actually think on the national highest level, the advantage of overturning that would be that that voice of innocent blood would stop speaking over the nation as a whole. That's exa it's, it's, it's about a legal, it's a legal yeah. issue. It's yeah. a legal issue. We, we know that as long as there's humankind on earth, yes. they're gonna, there's going to be abortions. I don't yes. care if they're in the back streets or the alleys or whatever. And it's not that we want women in jeopardy. That's not no. the issue. No. But here's the issue. When, when, when abortion or any other thing against God is legal, legalized on a national level. Okay, that gives the enemy a legal right to resist the will of God on a national level. Yeah, yeah. And so we we have to get this thing dealt with, shut down, so that yeah, so yeah. that the, it's it's no longer legally speaking against us, but but is but we're able to release the move of God instead. Yes. Well, when we come back for the third segment, Robert is going to share a prophetic blueprint really from what we see in the life of Elijah on how to, I believe, dismantle things in the spirit and prepare the way for the fire of God to fall in this nation. We'll be right back. Since 1983, Destiny Image has had a clear mandate, publish the prophets. Over the years, the team at Destiny has identified and published some of the most cutting edge and pioneering supernatural books of the generation, launching key leaders into visibility and helping bring the people of God into agreement with heaven's prophetic timeline. Every month, Destiny Image releases powerful new books that help believers understand and walk in the fullness of their prophetic destiny to be supernaturally conformed into the image of Jesus. Visit norimediagroup.com to learn about releases from Destiny Image and Harrison House Publishers. And visit destinyimage.tv for thousands of hours of on-demand video training and equipping on how to live a supernatural life.
Welcome back to The Resting Place. Larry Sparks here with my guest, Robert Henderson. We were just talking about three national sins. There's a fourth one that actually, I believe, withhold or prevent an available move of God. God's moving, Holy Spirit's available, but we've got the sin of idolatry. We've got broken covenants, shedding of innocent blood, but there is a fourth one as well, sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, absolutely. And see, sexual immorality historically is connected with the worship of other gods. Mm. Uh, for instance, there was always temple prostitutes, yep. both male and female, all sorts of you know evilness and wickedness that went on there. Uh, of course, we have a culture that is absolutely mm. you know eaten up. If Haywi you will. It's gone haywire. Yes, sexually. with, with sexual yes. immorality. I mean, I mean, all the stuff on the internet. Uh, everything that's so accessible, so available. Yeah. I mean, it, it just, it just uh, you know, takes what God meant to be a very pure and holy thing yeah. and perverts it and, you know, causes, cause it to be uh, a, a very grievous thing before God. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that really brings us to the days of Elijah and the whole powerful scene that so many are familiar with where he calls fire down from heaven. Mm -hmm. But for that fire, to be released, Elijah really need to actually deal with some stuff first mm -hmm. in the spirit realm. And Robert, the Lord has really given you such a kind of prophetic understanding of that, and I think how it relates to revival. So could you share? Yeah, I love the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel because whenever the fire does fall, the same people that wouldn't answer Elijah at all while he was preaching, they were just numb, mm. disinterested. The Bible says they fell on their face and they began to cry out, the Lord, he is God. God, yes. the Lord, He is God. So a nation yeah. began to turn back to God. Yeah. Well, of course, it was the whole um, uh, competition or combat battle between the prophets of Baal and Elijah himself that was the prophet of God. And there's so many things connected. Yeah. But but here, here's one of the things I want to just point out. Yeah. It, after all this was done and Elijah runs from Jezebel and he's intimidated and he ends up in a cave, he literally says, I'm the only one. And mm. God says, no, Elijah. He said, I've got 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So what I understand is that when Elijah stood on Mount Carmel, he felt like he was standing there by himself, but he was actually standing there in agreement with 7,000 that Baal had no ownership of. Mm. See, you can never pull down down what owns you. Mm. And so, so and when it, whenever he, uh, it was said that they have not bowed the knee, nor have they kissed him, that meant they were completely free from any allegiance and any alignment with Baal yes. and that spirit. Okay, so, so they were in the spirit contending. Okay, because of that, I believe that when Elijah stood on Mount Carmel, he was able to see the fire yes. come out of heaven that resulted in a nation beginning to turn back to God. So what that means yeah. is that I believe that there are people all across our nation that are and the nations that are crying out to God. And I believe that there are those that are sincere, that are holy, that are set apart. So I, and, and, and I believe that God would want them to know that their prayers are having an effect. Yeah. That whether, whether they think they are or not, or whether even the people that God might be using seemingly on the forefront think they are or not, there's actually a divine effect that's coming out of who the people of God mm. really are. I just, I want to go on that for a minute. I would love you to just share with the folks who are watching at home, because right now, one of the words being used is a remnant. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I believe God has historically, all he's needed is a remnant. Amen. But would you mind encouraging the people watching at home, just letting them, they, I, I believe there are many who are part of this 7,000, yes. so to speak. Yeah. Well, I, I would just encourage yeah. you very, very strongly that you need to know you who you are and what you're doing in the spirit world in prayer has an effect. Okay. Don't, don't, don't grow grow weary, according to Galatians 6, 9. Don't grow weary in well-doing, okay? But but be strengthened in the Lord and be inspired and know that just like those 7,000s were a part of the victory that was won on Mount Carmel, so what you are doing is empowering the purposes of God in the earth. Now, watch. It says that they had not bowed the knee, nor had they kissed Baal. In other words, there was no agreement. There was a, no alignment with them 
or even from their bloodline. There was no legal claim that Bell had against them. Therefore, they were able to stand in the spirit world and be a part of pulling that Baal thing, that Baal spirit down that was actually ruling and controlling a nation, that was controlling the way a nation thought. So I want to encourage you, let the Lord bring deep consecration in your life, but then be bold and take your position and let's believe together that our prayers are having an effect there in that spirit realm. Here's a question. As we kind of escalate, again, more and more people sense the intensity of what God is doing. Obviously, we see darkness in the earth. Isaiah 60, we see darkness, gross darkness upon the people. But that is a call for a greater or superior glory to arise on the people of God. In the context of where we are right now, is there one thing you think that would really produce a revival tipping point? Like, is there something that Holy Spirit's maybe highlighted to you that if, if we cross this threshold or if we engage this, it could open up the heavens over our land. There land. is a scripture in Zechariah chapter 3 where that Joshua the high priest has on unclean garments and God takes him through a process of cleansing him because Joshua is necessary because he is the one who is des- designated by God to represent a culture before him. Mm. And so he had to go in and he had to represent the culture of Israel before God for God to be able to release blessing. Yep. But whenever when they get when he gets Joshua the high priest cleaned up. If you read through uh, Zechariah 3, it's quite amazing. Uh, It literally says that as he functions there, that iniquity will be removed from the land in one day. Mm. So what that means is that when there is a company of people that can stand in the courts of heaven um, and represent a culture before the Lord on that level, that we can so move in the court of heaven that we legally get moved out of the way. The iniquity that's empowering the demonic spirits, yeah. the iniquity that's empowering them, that's allowing them to resist the move of God. We can have that removed in one day. Wow. See, it's, it doesn't have to be this long, drawn out, years worth of praying. Yeah. We can come as a people that know how to function in the courts, and we can stand and we can say, as a part of the culture of this nation, yeah. we petition you, we repent in behalf of it, and we ask that every legal claim of iniquity that's being used to empower the principalities over this nation, let that legal claim now be revoked because of that which the blood is saying uh, concerning it. And I'm telling you, it, it will be moved out of the way. Now, it's interesting because the very next verse says, it says, and it, it says that literally every man would invite his neighbor under his own vine and under his own fig tree. Here's what it says will happen. When that happens, a spirit of reconciliation comes yeah. into the land. Yeah. So you see, America is divided. There is yeah. such tension, racial tensions. Also, God says, when you remove the iniquity, yeah. not only are you going to see the glory of God, you're going to see the healing of culture. You're going to yeah. see the division the the tension. You're going to see a a spirit of reconciliation released that not only brings people to the Lord, because that's what God said to Paul or through Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, when he says literally that that Paul had been given the word and the ministry of reconciliation. Not only will it cause people to be reconciled to the Lord on a massive scale, but it will also cause people to be joined back together and healing will come to our nations. Well, I want to encourage you, your place in the spirit is to stand before the Lord, not just you individually. Recognize we are doing it as a company of people. We are standing as a house of prayer. We're not going to a building that's a house of prayer, although you can do that. We are a house of prayer representing our nation before the court of heaven. And I believe as we do, the fire of God will fall in Jesus' name.